Hello everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode of the Heavensward Dungeon Lore series. In this series, I hope to explain things you might not know about Final Fantasy XIV dungeons, as well as discuss their individual stories and lore. This episode's dungeon is the Great Gubal Library. The ancient civilization of Charlian has always been known for its pursuit of knowledge, and perhaps evenly so known for its state of neutrality in worldly affairs. While the original city remains far to the north of Eorzea, the Forum of Charlian decided during the Sixth Astral Era to branch out to an area known as the Dravanian Hinterlands, bringing a score of scholars and students along to establish what would become a new colony in Eorzea, recognised even as one of the city-states in the region. While the studies conducted turned out to regard the Ethereal Sea, many noted scholars such as Matoya and Louisois were known to have visited the colony, with the former even remaining there and Alphano and Alizé even being born in the place. However, thanks to the Galian invasion of Eorzea, the Forum in Charlian made the decision to perform an exodus of the place, to avoid conflict and remain neutral, calling every citizen back to their mainland. In doing so, the many buildings and structures were abandoned, eventually becoming decrepit or overrun by nature, and even the huge repository of knowledge, the Great Dubal Library, was left to its whims with only the library's defences in place. Back with the Warrior of Light and friends, the group is still in mourning over the loss of Horshavont. Resolved to move forward, we try to determine not only the meaning of Az's law, but the odd, primal-like powers demonstrated by the Knights of the Heaven's Ward. To attempt to find their location, Lucia suggests visiting the Sea of Clouds, as their ship, the Soleil, was sighted there recently. As we arrive, Alphano expects the Vanu to be in greater number, but oddly enough there are none in sight. As we head towards the nearby settlement, we discover a familiar foe and a handful of Galian troops, who in turn surround a scared Vanu. The troops give mention of a Lord Van Hydrus during the battle, after which Lonu Vanu, the now rescued Vanu, guides us to Ok Zundu, home of the Zundu tribe of their race. On approach however, a piercing cry rings out, that of Bismarck, the huge white whale-like creature said to be the patron deity of the Vanu. The creature then appears, flying upwards and consuming a small island whole. After this we speak with Sonu Vanu, chieftain of Oxindu, and explain the situation of searching for the Soleil. He tells us that it is likely the Heaven's Ward come to seek the key to unlocking Az's law, but it so happens that Bismarck has now devoured the island on which the key was held. He sends us to speak to Kunu Vali, who tells the origins of the true Bismarck, and how he was rejected by his black feathered brothers for his difference, fell to the earth below and created the Sea of Clouds. The Bismarck roaming the area, however, is a creation of the Vundu, filled with their vengeance and hate. Reconvening with Sid and Alphano, we share our findings, and while Alphano has discovered naught but advice on sky fishing, Sid jumps at the idea and suggests a wild plan to lure Bismarck out using an island as bait, with the Enterprise pulling the mass along. Sid heads off to begin preparations, and we return to Sonu Vanu once more to discuss the plan. While Sonu appears to believe that the plan holds little hope, he is not within rights to stop the Warrior of Light from trying, and commits to find a suitable island for Bismarck. We return to the Enterprise once more, and thankfully Sid has the preparations in place and asks that we speak to Wedge when ready with our companions in hand, preparing to take on the White Whale. In battle, Bismarck calls the heavens themselves upon the group, along with many of the Vundu Vanu and two paired serpent-like spawns. Once the group manages to break the hard shell of Bismarck's back, as well as deal vital damage to its core, the beast is felled. When Bismarck vanishes, the metallic key falls from the air and lands in front of us, and as we collect it, a vision ensues and we reawaken our crystal of wind, and this time we begin once more to hear Hydaelyn's voice. Unfortunately, however, we turn around and find ourselves face to face with Thordon and Igeorm, the Asian scene after defeating the ultimate weapon. Igeorm binds the Warrior of Light and comments on our fragile connection to Hydaelyn, using her powers to collect and deliver the key to Thordon. The Archbishop holds the key aloft, where it activates and shines a beam of light skyward pointing the way to Az's law, and Igayon releases the bind, leaving along with Thordon as they re-enter the Soleil. 
To make matters worse, we return to Ogzundu where we discover regular Van Hydris himself surrounding the Varni with his troops, and after revealing ourselves to him, we come face to face with Varys Zos Galvis, the Emperor himself. Varys orders the execution of the Vanu, but Lucia arrives and blasts the troops with her Magitek armor, after which the troops with Varys in tow return to the enormous battleship floating overhead. We speak with Sid and inform him of the situation, after which we attempt to make our own way to Azizlar. After discovering that Lucia is the sister of Livia, one of the leading Galian figures we defeated in the Praetorium, we find our way to Azizlar barred by a field of ether. We then return to Ishgard, and events ensue which lead us on the trail to recovering Ishtola, who appears to be trapped in the lifestream. With the help of Kane Senna, she is released from the flow and returns to the world. We soon speak with her on a means to create a ram to barge into Azizlar, and although Ishtola states she is incapable of producing the means, she knows one who might, her old master Matoya. This leads us to striking out towards the Dravanian hinterlands to Matoya's cave. Along the way, we cross the bridge over the Thaliak River via Idleshire, where we assist the goblins there and meet an old friend in Brayflock's Ultox, defending herself from the Illuminati goblins, still upset over their cheese recipe, and proceed to the southern part of the hinterlands to discover Matoya's cave behind a hidden wall. Matoya and Yashtola are pleased to meet once more, albeit in a slightly passive-aggressive conversation, and after explaining the situation, Matoya agrees to lend her aid in creating the ram. She tells us of her research into creating an etheric converger, a device that was condemned by the forum for its potential danger if it fell into the wrong hands. As the knowledge was now unusable under Charlian law, the tome Matoya made was housed in the Great Gubal Library, the bastion of knowledge left behind after the Charlian Exodus. She therefore lends us two companions in Pero Rogo and Brumzi, who lead the way to the entrance of the enormous building to the east, but Brumzi warms us as the library's natural defences, as we prepare to retrieve the important tome. We find ourselves starting off in the reading room of the library, proceeding through to defeat a handful of flying creatures that presumably wandered in from the outside, or are otherwise the abandoned familiars of the library's previous inhabitants. As we enter the area for the School of Phantasmagoria, a magical bridge appears before us, and we proceed down the new surface and defeat one of the library's presumed defences in sentient ink horns. This trend is continued throughout the dungeon, as we see books themselves spring to life and assault the party. Upon the second platform of the area lies a tome regarding the hierarchy of Galian society. It details the titles used by Galians and what each of them mean in turn. Zos, such as seen with Varys Zos Galvis, is the title given to the Emperor while Ye is given to members in the line of succession. Weir, meanwhile, is given to those without claim to the throne. On the militaristic side, Van is given to the Legatus of the Galian armies seen in Gaius Van Belsar or regular Van Hydrus. Toll is given to the highest ranking tribunus like Nero Toll Skaver, and Sass is given to the lower ranking tribunus or guards of the Praetorium, such as Livia Sass Juniors. Rem is given to the leaders of cohorts of troops, usually in the vanguard. Quo for centurions of the army, Peer to the officers of an army such as Eulus Peer Norbanus, and Owen to the individual soldiers of the army. Lastly for the specialists in the ranks of Garlemald, Nan is given to a chief engineers such as Sid Nan Garland, Mal to the head of the research of medicine such as Aulus Mal Asina, Lux to the chief of medicine or a technician, Kir to a senior medic, and Jen to a standard medic or technician. We proceed through the next set of rooms in the library until we reach the room preceding the Hall of Magics, where a second volume on the hierarchy lies on the nearby table. This one tells of public officials titles such as Eel, given to a dictator, Het for a consul, praetor or quester, Goe given to censors or rectors, 
usually rulers of smaller provinces in Garlemald, such as one Lucia Goe Junius might once have ruled. Fay and Ea, while stated as being unknown in the book, were usually the deputies for rectors in their territories, or magistrate lawmakers responsible for giving public land respectively, and Deuce was given to the basic civil servants such as bodyguards or notaries. We learned finally that the titles were given to many citizens, although not as commonly used, with Bass being the title for an average working citizen, Sen being used for particular artisans and skilled traders, and Arn being used as a term for slaves, or those coming from annexed territories. It is noted however that those with the latter can make up their worth by enlisting in the Galia military for many years. After this, we finally reach the Hall of Magics proper, where we find a demonic tome with a familiar looking fiend protruding from its pages. During the fight, the tome attempts to liquefy the party using dark waves of magic along the floor. When injured, the demon pushes the party back and closes its pages, preparing a deadly blast. The party must run to behind the spine of the tome before it unleashes the blast to avoid it. Later in the battle, the tome uses ice magic to freeze the floor, once again attempting to blast the party in the meantime, however this time the group must slide to the back of the tome to avoid the blast. Upon defeat, the tome falls and we can proceed to the opposite corridor. We defeat a few more wandering creatures and familiars, and see a tome fall from the air, spawning forth another fiend known as Page 64, after which we continue on to find a blocked pathway via a magic barrier. Defeating the enemies nearby clears the way, but in the side room another book speaks of the several elements and their creation and weakness. It shows how each element can be born of another such as lightning igniting whatever it falls upon and creating fire. It also shows what each element can be prevented by, such as wind being able to erode the earth. In the opposite room, a tome can be found regarding the original voyages of Merwib Blurfwissen to the western isles of Eorzea. While the writer ponders if her crew were the first to strike upon the isles, it cannot be denied that their maps and charts were instrumental to establishing trade in the current era. It goes on to regard the stories of the crews as entertaining, noting the Mamulja's curious desire to see them dead. Because of this, the inspiration for a myriad new crews to set out for exploring was set forever. The party proceeds through another corridor until they reach the Astrology and Astromancy camera, where a large tome falls open and summons forth Biblos, a bipedal behemoth-like creature. During the fight, the creature uses its horns and tail to swipe at the party, and when injured, the Biblos becomes invincible and summons forth more page 64s to the arena. The party must defeat one of these creatures, and use the magical fire to burn and push Biblos out of its tone, causing it to become vulnerable again. They must also avoid or purposefully burst the small wind orbs to ensure the flame does not get blown out. After this, we can proceed down the stairs to the School of Fantastics, where we find a handful of what look like void scent to the arena, as well as several Dullahans patrolling the corridors. After proceeding past the closed gate, we find a diary on the floor. This diary is part of a tale surrounding a goldsmith from Gridania, and tells of his desire to call forth a succubus into this world from the void, forever wishing to have Lady Amandine for his own. It speaks of the vessel the man chained to his bed as to not have it escape, and the simple idea of the ritual is enough to have his blood pumping. Proceeding down the final stairs, we find a second part to the diary, with the man severely regretting his choice, feeling sick from the writhing of its tentacles. The party then tackles and defeats another page and the owlish creature calling Void Scent, and the forbidden library doors open to reveal the library's true guardian. We see a large creature known as the ever-living Bibliotaph, who cries out and attacks the party. During this fight, the Bibliotaph intermittently attempts to use summoning circles to call forth Void Scent, but the party can prevent this by having members stand on the circles an equal number to the glowing symbols. The creature uses deep darkness and magic burst, forcing the party close or far respectively, and on the second attempt to summon Void Scent, a Void Spark is placed on a party member, leaving a lingering explosion behind. After preventing the Bibliotaph from summoning and avoiding its magics, 
the creature falls and is defeated. The Warrior of Light experiences another vision of their crystals, awakening to a fifth one, and upon returning to the room, Pero Rogo discovers Matoya's tome. We return to the cave and hand the tome over to Matoya, who thanks us for retrieving it, and moves on to use the research to develop the etheric ram. A few other visits are made to the library in various pursuits, usually for the pursuit of knowledge for an experienced job user. Summoners, attempting to lure the servants of La Habrea into a trap to destroy them once and for all, travel to the library with Dancing Wolf and Yamitra to discover a tome that allows them to unleash a blast of energy during a dreadworm trance. Arriving at the library, the Asians appear and a battle ensues, after which the adventuring summoner successfully channels the burst of power at the fleeing villain, destroying him for good. Red Mages, on the other hand, journey to the library in search of a forbidden tome, thought by Jeruntia to be used by Lambard to develop darker magics. The tome tells of an Ishgardian murderer who thought themselves part demon, and is described as being chock full of lunacy. We enter the Rhapsody's quadrangle section of the place, defeating the library's guardians until we reach the last corridor, where a handful of books lay scattered on the floor. The first tells of a knight known as Trefaniel from Ishgard, who executed a member of the clergy for acts upon a small boy from the broom. Though the book doesn't go into further detail, Trefaniel will go on to be stripped of his knighthood for the deed, but maintain his values and become the forefather of Dark Knights. The next book is a sketchbook full of depictions of female deities in various stages of undress, with no notable male depictions whatsoever. The third details a series of killings during the Thorn Dynasty in Uldar, and of how the killer left behind cards from the deck of Arcana upon each victim. Although officials seemed to think that the culprit was divining his victims, rumours spread that the Arcana was simply a cover-up for political assassinations, as many of the victims were opposed to the royal throne. The fourth book, titled The Angel in Darkness, is too illegible to read. The final tome is an old diary that once again belonged to the Gridanian goldsmith, detailing his visit to Lady Amandine of Hawk Manor. Although he visited the manor with his masterpiece in tow, what he saw within he felt was true perfection. Interacting with the last book awakens the bibliotaph that guards the inner reaches of the library, and Zeruntia assists us in defeating it. Afterwards, the Nightkin falls from within its body and we examine it. The author details their belief of being descended from demons, and tainted with their blood, and that though the knights may find the teachings within heresy, the faith he holds is the true one. And after this, we'll leave the library for the final time. And that's the end of the story and lore for the Great Gubal Library. An unsurprising wealth of knowledge lying within, with details from all across the world, left behind by the Charlians as they maintain their ever stubborn neutrality, even in times of war. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more Final Fantasy XIV lore, and I'll see you next time for the Etheric Chemical Research Facility.